<laughs> we welcome you to Calvary Bible Chapel on this beautiful Lord's Day morning, and we pray God's richest blessing upon you as you sit under the ministry of His Word this morning. We've had a little bit of a technical difficulty, so there won't be a, uh, a PowerPoint this morning. I apologize for that. I also apologize for not having a, a YouTube video for all of you who are following us there, and there are a few. Uh, so I do apologize for that being uh, sick last week. Uh, this week we are going to try to finish our study of the Incarnation. And uh, I'll try to do my best here to uh, remind you a little bit of what we've been over so far. The first week we looked at sonship before Incarnation in the book of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, the same was in the beginning with God. The sonship of the Incarnation. Then we looked at the sovereignty of the Incarnation. And we looked at the book of Matthew, and we actually went through the genealogy there in the book of Matthew, and we saw God's sovereignty as he portrayed God as king, or as Christ as king. Two weeks ago, we looked at the separateness of the Incarnation, and we looked in the book of Luke. And uh, I will remind you that even Luke has Mary's genealogy. question I will be asking in just a moment is, why is there only two genealogies? Why is there only a genealogy in Matthew and in Luke? Why no genealogy in John? And then this morning, uh, by God's grace, we will look at the servanthood of the Incarnation. The servanthood of the Incarnation. And we're going to look at the book of Mark. Why doesn't Mark have a genealogy? Why does Matthew have a genealogy? Well, we mentioned that Matthew portrays Christ as king. And if you're going to be the king, you have to have a genealogy. We mentioned that Luke portrays Christ as man. And if you're going to be a man, then definitely you have a genealogy. But when you think about John, the Gospel of John, John is portrayed, portrays Christ as God. And so there would be no need for a genealogy. This morning we're going to look in the book of Mark, would you turn there with me? Mark chapter 1. And in doing so, we're going to think about Christ as a servant. Christ as a servant. The servanthood of the incarnation. And you may surmise that a servant doesn't have a genealogy either. It doesn't matter for a servant to have a genealogy. And so it's an interesting perspective. Matthew is king, John as God, Luke as man, and now this morning Christ as a servant in the book of Mark. Let's begin in verse 1. It says, In the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths. And then I want you to note that word straight. Make his paths straight. It's an important word in the Gospel of Mark. Of the 56 times it's used in the New Testament, 46 of them are used in the Gospel of Mark. 46 times the word straight or straightway is used. Here, obviously speaking of John the Baptist and his ministry to make Christ's path straight. Verse 4, John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for remission of sins. And there went out unto him, un, unto him all the land of Judea, and they, 
of Jerusalem and were baptized of him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. And John, with cl- clo- John was clothed with camel's hair and with a girdle and the skin of his loins. And he did eat locusts of wild honey and preached, saying, There cometh one mightier than uh, than I after me, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop and unloose. I indeed baptize you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. And it came to pass in those days that when Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee, he was baptized of John and Jordan. So you get the picture here, right? That um, We find Christ at approximately 30 years old in the book of Mark. Nothing truly is said of his younger life because he doesn't need a genealogy. A servant doesn't need a genealogy. He just needs to serve. And so the picture here, it begins with in the book, uh, in the gospel of Luke here, excuse me, the gospel of Mark, with him starting to serve. Well, when Jesus was mentioned as king in Matthew, he needed a genealogy. When Jesus was mentioned as a man in Luke, he needed a genealogy. They started at the beginning of his life. Listen again to the beginning of the book or the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John portrays Christ as God, and that's where it begins. And so see the stress here in the Gospel of Mark. We begin here at Jesus' baptism. He's approximately already 30 years old. He's being portrayed as a servant all through the book of Mark. Verse 10, it says, and again, I stress the word straightway. And straightway. Coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens open and the spirit like a dove descending upon him. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And now the word immediately. It's the same word And straightway, and immediately the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness. Into the wilderness. What happened in the wilderness? Was this a time of rejoicing? Was this an easy time for Christ? No, he went for 40 days in the wilderness. And he was tempted of the devil in that time, wasn't he? And there he was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted of Satan, and was with wild beasts, and the angels ministered unto him. Straightway. Extremely important. What kind of uh, servant would you think Christ to be if he came to the earth and the Father asked him to do something as a servant, and he said, okay, I'll get around to it when I feel like it. But that's not the picture here. The picture is immediately, immediately when the Father wanted him to do something, when the Holy Spirit led him to do something, immediately, straightway, he did it. All throughout the Gospel of Mark. Straightway on the Sabbath day, he entered into the synagogue and taught. Later on in verse 21. Verse 29, and forthwith, again, the same word. When they were come out of the synagogue, they entered into the, then they entered into the house of Simon, Andrew, and James, and John. When Jesus uh, perceived in his spirit that they were wondering in chapter 2, he, he immediately perceives in his spirit time and time and time again. Christ in the book of Mark, is portrayed as a servant. And so, I want to stress that this morning. As we finish this study of Christ's incarnation, we we want to go to 
our Savior, portrayed as a servant. And would you turn with me, please, to Isaiah chapter 52. Isaiah chapter 52. I don't want us to, and, and I'm so thankful that we have the opportunity this morning to finish celebrating this incarnation season. Yesterday, I think, was New Year's Day, right? This incarnation season with, with, with service, with our Lord's service to us. Isaiah chapter 52 and we'll start in verse 13. Isaiah chapter 52 and verse 13. Behold my, and now the next word, beloved, is servant, shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. As many were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. Here in Isaiah chapter 52, our Savior again is prophesied hundreds of years before he came to this earth. He is prophesied as a servant. What kind of servant was Christ? Well, obviously he was the perfect servant, wasn't he? What well, we want to focus on this morning, beloved, is what service did Christ do for us here on this earth? In, uh, <clears throat> you don't have to turn to these verses. You write them down if you'd like and check me. I, I think they were going to be on the PowerPoint. Uh, Zechariah chapter 3 verse 8 says, For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. In Isaiah chapter 42, it says, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my elect, in whom my soul delighteth. In Isaiah chapter 59, And now saith the Lord that formed me from the womb to be his servant. And so Mark, the gospel of Mark, is not the only place where Christ is portrayed as a servant. Numerous places in the Old Testament we, we see Christ as a servant. But for me, beloved, if you will, please turn to Philippians chapter 2. Uh, it, this is the, the verse that, that brings it all together. Philippians chapter 2. The Apostle Paul ties all of the references of Christ being a servant. Ties them in so beautifully here to this wonderful portion of Scripture that I'm sure that numerous, many of you have brought to memory. Let's start in verse 5. It says, Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. It wasn't anything to be grasped at for him, literally, because he was God. But now Paul says, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. Christ, reacting immediately after his baptism into the desert, to be tempted for 40 days was just the beginning, if you will, of his servanthood as we celebrate his incarnation. You realize, beloved, that Christ came to serve. It says, He took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. And then it says, And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. The purpose, and I trust it was not lost to you and I as we went through this incarnation season, the purpose for Christ coming and becoming a man was so that he 
would become obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. As we contemplate the wonder of the incarnation, the infinite God became a man. The Bible describes it in very plain language. We've read this a couple of times already. It says the word was God and the word was made or became flesh and dwelt among us. John chapter 1 verse 14. The eternal one stepped into time. The God who never had a beginning and who always existed was born as an infant. Micah chapter 5, Isaiah chapter 7 and 9. The Almighty rested in the arms of Mary as a dependent baby. The creator of all things lay in a receptacle built for feeding animals. The one who was high and lifted up was greeted by lowly shepherds. The incarnation was the point in time at which God's eternal Son assumed our humanity without ceasing to be God. The Son of God became the Son of Man, that we, the Son of Man, might become the sons of God. May we ever be filled with wonder and praise because of the condescending love and grace by which he stooped so low in order to raise us so high. Oh, beloved, let us pause and praise God this morning. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. The infinite became finite. The Almighty consented to become weak. He that upheld all things by the word of his power willingly became helpless. He that spake all world, worlds into existence resigned for a while even the power of speech. In all these things he fulfilled the will of his Father. What a servant our Savior was. Let it not be lost on us, beloved, that Christ came, and we celebrate that this time of year. And I know that for most people, Christmas is the most wonderful time of the year. It's the, the time that we look forward to the most. But for you and I as Christians, it's just the beginning. It's the beginning of celebrating our Savior's servanthood to us. He served you. He served you. He became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. In just a few minutes, we will be celebrating the Lord's table. And each time, it has been my privilege to be able to read through Isaiah chapter 53. Just a few moments ago, we began and we read a little bit of Isaiah chapter 52. Will you go back to Isaiah chapter 52? I don't want this to get lost on us this morning. And I don't know that it's something that I truly realized until a few weeks ago when I started this study that the prophecy of Isaiah 53 doesn't start in verse 1. It actually begins back in chapter 52, verse 13. It says, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. As many were astonished at thee, his, vidges, his visage excuse me, was so marred more than any man, his form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations. The kings shall shut their mouths at him. For that which had been told them, they shall see. 
uh, had not been told them, excuse me, they shall see. And that which they had not heard, they shall consider. For the moments that we have before we celebrate the Lord's table, I'd like to just go through Isaiah 53. It is the most quoted portion of Scripture from the Old Testament in the New Testament. Christ applied the prophecy to himself in Luke chapter 22. He, we also know that uh, Philip referred to Christ in Acts chapter 8 from Isaiah chapter 53. You may also remember that in Acts chapter 8, that the Ethiopian eunuch, when he heard these words, as Philip applied them to Christ, it was this that brought the Ethiopian eunuch to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter quoted Isaiah chapter 53 and 1 Peter chapter 2, numerous portions of Scripture all refer to Isaiah chapter 52, verses 13, and on through chapter 53. But I don't know that I've ever really stepped back and took a, a view of this as Christ as a servant. Please do not get lost in verse 13 of chapter 52. Behold my servant. My servant. So now let's look in Isaiah chapter 53. Let's start in verse 1. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? The arm of the Lord. It signifies the servant's grandest manifestation of power. Sometimes the Bible speaks of his finger. Sometimes the Bible speaks of his arm, or excuse me, of his hand. But it was when Christ was here serving humanity at the cross that the term the arm of the Lord is used. It is by these means that God revealed his holiness and love to the highest degree. There we see the divine power in its noblest form, in its grandest operation, in its widest sweep, in its loftiest purpose. That humble man, lowly and poor, despised and rejected in life, hanging faint and paled on the Roman cross, and dying in the dark, it seems a strange manifestation of God's greatest glory. But it is. It is, beloved, the arm of the Lord revealed to us. The greatest manifestation of God's glory. Verse 2, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of the dry ground. He hath no form, no comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Yes, Jesus grew up before Christ as a tender, or before his father as a tender plant. He dwelt with the Father, and he delighted in everything that he did. The next phrase, Christ was a root out of a dry ground. You have tried to plant something in dry ground. Well, you may have tried to plant something in dry ground, but uh, you probably didn't do very well. But think about Christ planted in this earth. It was dry. It, was, it, it wasn't fertile at all. 
And yet I want you to see how Christ was fruitful. This is miraculous. That Christ, and this could be a note of his virgin birth. A root of a dry ground is miraculous. Christ was a root out of the dry ground of humanity. And that he was sinless. It refers to his virgin birth by which the Son of God became a man yet without sin. And yet he lacked comeliness, didn't he? He hath no form, no comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Uh, many portrayals of Christ in Hollywood, and he's so handsome, and I don't know that that's necessarily what we should think of our Savior physically. He was undesirable, maybe not physically, but to, to the Jewish nation and to us as well, to the world. Remember that we were enemies. We were his enemies when he died. Uh, the men who followed him the closest, the, the most loyal men were, were fishermen and, and tax collectors. He did not wear robes. He did not live in luxury. And you will realize that he was rejected. There was no beauty that we should desire him. In Christ's incarnation, we learn to see things through God's eyes and to measure things by God's standards. Verse 3. He was despised and rejected a man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we, deste we, esteemed, excuse me, and we esteemed him not. Isaiah 53 speaks, uh, uh, verse 3 now speaks again of the nation of Israel's lack of desire for Christ. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. He was rejected from his hometown in Nazareth. He was rejected by his own brothers. He was rejected by Jerusalem. Christ went about doing good and showing the love of God to everyone he met. Yet his own people demanded that he be crucified. His life of sorrow, rejection, is emphasized here in verse 3. It is a, a very interesting study. It's not one that I'm prepared to do right now, but to, to think about these Hebrew words. He's despised, rejected of man, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, hid as it were, our faces from him, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Eleven Hebrew words. Eleven Hebrew words. He was most definitely beloved, a man of sorrows. Uh, in a few moments, uh, as we close our service, we will be singing Hallelujah. What a Savior, written by Philip Bliss. Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came. Verse 4. Surely he hath borne our griefs, and he hath carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace is upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we, like street, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before his shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and judgment. Who shall declare his generation? He was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people was he stricken. When you think of these verses, and we will continue to read just a few more, it, it is uh, stressing here his atonement. 
the substitutionary atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ for you and I. Twelve times in this very short passage, starting in verse 4, his atonement is mentioned. He bore our griefs. He carried our sorrows. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Verse 6, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. Verse 8, thou shalt make his soul an offering. Verse 10, he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. Verse 11, he shall bear their iniquities. And verse 12, he shall bear the sin of many. This is, beloved, the servanthood of incarnation. Verse 7, again, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. This speaks of great submission, doesn't it? He was made in the likeness of man and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Christ silence in the face of his affliction when we think of Jesus' actions throughout his arrest, trial, mockings, beatings, and crucifixions, he does not resist any of the injustice or cruelty that he was met with. He did not complace, uh, complain. He did not express anger or bitterness. Yes, as a sheep is brought before the lamb is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Verse 8, Christ imprisoned. When you think about all of the injustice that happened as a prisoner, again, his servanthood here, beloved. Let's just very quickly in our minds chronologically go through this great injustice that happened to him on that night. He was taken from prison, Gethsemane, he was then taken as a prisoner to Annan, Annas and Caiaphas. He was taken in prison from Caiaphas to the hall of the Sanhedrin. He was taken from prison to the Sanhedrin to Pilate. He was taken as a prisoner from Pilate to Herod. He was taken as a prisoner back to Herod to Pilate. He was finally taken as a prisoner from Pilate to Calvary. The cross is the culmination of the whole. Verse 8 also mentions, who shall declare his generation? The unbelieving Jew did not know Jesus' generation. And so the answer would be, no one. No one on this earth would declare his generation. Verse 9, Christ's grave he made his grave with the wicked, with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was there any deceit in his mouth. We know that he was buried in a borrowed tomb from a man named Joseph. And we also, and we've stressed this already, his, sinless here, his sinlessness is again stressed in verse 9. Verse 10, his, and we'll read verse 10 through 12. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed and prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the tra travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. For he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great Divide him a, the, the spoil with the strong because he hath poured out his soul unto death and his, he was numbered with the transgressors. He bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. We see here the prosperity in beginning in verse 10. Yes, it did please the Lord to bruise him and to put him to grief to make his soul an offering for sin, 
But now it's, we see that the culmination of this here in the middle of verse 10, it says, But he shall see his seed, and he shall prolong his day. There, there's the resurrection. It says, And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Beloved, no person that dies prospers again on earth except for Christ because of this wonderful, wonderful truth of the resurrection, prolonging his days, his, his justification, his, his overcoming death, and it ends in verse 12 with Christ interceding for the transgressors. Jesus prayed even on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25 says, Wherefore he is all able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. This has been just a, a very quick and brief look into the servanthood that begins with Christ's incarnation. Of course, this begs a question for you and I this morning. If Christ came to this earth to serve, and he died for us, he paid the penalty of sin for us, he, he saved us, what, beloved, are we doing for him? Are we truly servants for Christ? How much of the past year could you look back and say, yes, I did that for my Savior? And how much can we look back and say, no, I, I think I did that for me? As we begin this new year, let us begin with a renewed consecration to serve our wonderful Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time, for this opportunity again to look into your word. As we come now, Lord, to the Lord's table this morning, we ask that uh, it would be time of 